most dangerous bandidos in history. Arrested yesterday, two of them right here in San Antonio. Today, we're looking closer into documents the U.S. Attorney's Office sent us regarding that case. Behind the glamorous and adrenaline-charged world of outlaw motorcycle clubs, one biker club ignites fear whenever mentioned, the Bandidos. These gangster brothers have taken the world by storm, devouring their enemies in one strike, leaving local authorities struggling to catch up with them. But amidst this misplaced brevity and six, a few Bandidos have built a name for themselves, and not in a good way. From heists that could put any movie to shame to face-offs with rival gangs that would sound unbelievable unless you saw them, these bandido leaders have done enough to earn their place as legends in the world of outlaw bikers. So today, we dive deep into the annals of the biker underworld to bring you a list of the most dangerous bandidos to ever walk the face of the earth. But before then, in March 1966, a small motorcycle club was formed in San Leon, Texas, and it grew rapidly, recruiting thousands of members globally. They're not your regular weekend riders, they're deeply committed to the biker lifestyle, talk of beards, tattoos, and lots of leather. The bandito structure is tight, with chapters around the globe, each running its own show. But under the big mighty bandito's umbrella, every chapter boasts a hierarchy reminiscent of some multinational corporations, with presidents, vice presidents, and even a sergeant at arms. Over the years, the Bandidos have had their fair share of face-offs with other major biker gangs, especially the Hells Angels, with both seeking dominance in the motorcycle underworld. Between 1994 and 1997, initial run-ins between the Hells Angels and the Bandidos led to a multi-year conflict in Scandinavia, which was covered in our video, The Most Dangerous Enemies of the Bandidos. The turf war is marked by bombings, shootings, and all-out chaos, leading to nearly a dozen deaths and many more injuries. But it's not just the Hell's Angels, the Outlaws, Mongols, and Cax have also felt the Bandidos' heat. These rivalries, often marked by territorial disputes and power plays, have only fueled the rise of ruthless Bandido leaders. From Don Chamberef to Giovanni Musadir, these are just but a few of the most dangerous bandidos to ever walk the face of the earth. Don Chambers. Don is one of the most celebrated visionaries in the bandidos' history. In the mid-1960s, Don decides to bring together a handful of friends disillusioned by other biker gangs and craft a brotherhood rocking a patch showcasing a chubby sombrero-clad character named Fredo Bandido, the club's iconic mascot. Don's bandidos quickly become the talk of the town and with grit, tenacity, and a touch of renegade spirit, he steers them from being a Texan sensation into an international phenomenon. In 1972, Chambers is arrested and sentenced to two consecutive life sentences for the murders of two drug dealers in El Paso. Skip Hollinsworth, the chief editor for Texas Monthly Magazine, documents that the nature of the murders shed light into Chambers and the club's ruthlessness. In his 2007 profile of the gang, Hollinsworth writes that the police said that before killing the dealers, Chambers had made them dig their own graves. He adds that Chambers and the other banditos had set their bodies on fire before burying them. Chambers dies while on parole in 1999, but his rebellious ethos lives on in one of the banditos' mottos, we are the people our parents warned us about, which is firmly engraved on his tombstone at Forest Park in Houston. Now, with Don Chambers having been sentenced to life imprisonment for murder in 1972, Ronald Jerome Ronnie Hodge takes over an already established club. Ronnie Hodge. If Don Chambers was the spark that ignited the banditos, Ronnie Hodge was the gasoline that kept the flame roaring. Stepping up as president of the banditos, Ronnie is faced with the unenviable task of navigating the club through a period of change and growth. First, the club goes into retrenchment, where he and other leaders dial back the violence and focus on turning profits through criminal rackets and drug operations, all in an effort to stay under the radar. Under his leadership, the banditos see dramatic expansions, but not without challenges. The 70s and 80s are rife with territorial disputes, rivalries, and all-out gang wars. At this time, Ronnie helps the banditos establish an empire outside of Texas, including in Australia. So on Father's Day in Australia 1984, he is informed as chaos ensues in Milpera, a southwestern suburb of Sydney, New South Wales, 
leading to the deaths of seven people and leaving 28 others seriously injured in what comes to be known as the Milpera Massacre. For someone who had never felt like he belonged anywhere, Ronnie runs the Bandido affairs exceptionally until he hands over the reins to Glenn Merritt, another legendary figure in the history of the Bandidos. Starting in the late 1990s, Merritt establishes himself as a major player in the club, especially as he leads the powerful Bellingham chapter. Glenn stamps his authority with his involvement in conflicts with other small motorcycle clubs, distributing meth, and trafficking in bike parts. But that's not all, his charisma and leadership make the Bandidos Bellingham chapter thrive despite the local authorities always being a step behind. Under Glenn's reign, the chapter also organizes some of the wildest parties and charity events, which often resulted in gunfights and arrests. Glenn makes the Bandidos members rebels with a heart, and that remains so until 2005. On June 8, 2005, he is among the club members arrested in a series of pre-dawn raids by federal agents and local police. The case was massive, and in asking for a significant sentence, Assistant United States Attorney Bruce Mayak writes in a memo about Glenn that he has a long history of a variety of illegal activities, including drug distribution, trafficking in stolen motor vehicles, and violence toward others. The defendant appears to have fully embraced the outlaw attitude, as demonstrated by his brash behavior toward others. However, Glenn is quick to plead guilty, and he is sentenced to four years in prison and three years of supervised release, after which he effectively retires from the club. George Wagers. In the early 1950s, a boy is born in Whatcom County, Washington. His name is George Wagers, and he is expected to lead a normal life, which he does for the most part. Except George is overly spurred by the Harley-Davidson motorcycle that their neighbor parks in his driveway. The adoration soon grows into a passion, which he explores once he is old enough to join a motorcycle club, and his choice, the Bandidos. Once George steps foot inside the club, there is no turning back, and by 1998, he becomes the Bandidos international president. In an unprecedented move, the new president moves the club's headquarters from Texas to Bellingham, Washington, where the Bandidos have now established themselves as a major force. Unlike most of his predecessors, George makes an individual effort to ensure that he influences how every chapter is run. As Edward Winterhalder mentions in his book Out in Bad Standings, although George is intent on keeping a low profile, he is arrested in 2005 after a two-year federal investigation with overwhelming evidence, including phone taps. He pleads guilty and is given a much-reduced sentence of just 20 months in prison. In 2010, he suffers spinal injuries in a motorcycle accident, leading to his official retirement from the club. When George Wagers is arrested in 2005, Jeffrey Pike, his vice president, assumes leadership of the club. His reign is completely different from his predecessors. In a bid to expand the Bandidos' territory, Jeffrey finds himself ruffling the feathers of other equally powerful clubs. In 2006, he and his then vice president, John Xavier Portillo, order the killing of Anthony Benes, who is attempting to start a Texas chapter of the Hells Angels and had ignored the Bandidos' warnings to cease recruitment. Jeffrey and Portillo do this in a bid to hold on to the biggest Bandido state, but it is a move that comes back to haunt them more than a decade later. After successfully leading the Bandidos for 13 years, they are arrested in May 2018 and charged with the deaths of rival club members, as well as multiple counts of violence, racketeering, and drug trafficking. In September 2018, Jeffrey is sentenced to life plus 10 years, marking the end of an era that will be looked back on and remembered by the Bandidos faithful. In the early 2000s, Jason Addison Lee, better known as Dog in the Bandido world, establishes himself as a pivotal member of the Bandido leadership. Despite not holding any official position, Jason's hard work earns him his nickname, and he is rewarded with a leadership role as president, an opportunity he grabs with both hands. His new position at the club earns him fame, but he also finds himself on the wrong side of the law. In 2015, he is arrested and arraigned in court for extortion, having allegedly forced a former Bandidos member to sign over his business to him. Although he is acquitted two years later, in November 2018, the local authorities in Melbourne, Australia, 
are alerted to Jason's plan to lead up to 400 by gang members heading for the annual meeting through the city on the day before Victoria went into its state elections. On the day of the meeting, at a predetermined venue, the police outnumber and intercept the convoy. They then breath test and drug test every member, as well as checking for licenses, outstanding warrants, and unregistered bikes, leading to the arrest of just one member. Jason is barred from acquiring, owning, or using any firearm in 2018, which sets grounds for him to be ousted from his presidential seat in the early 2020s. Giovanni Muschedere. In 1959, an Italian immigrant couple living in Ontario gives birth to a son, Giovanni Musadir, who would later earn himself the nickname Boxer as he rises up the ranks of the Banditos. As a young boy, Musadir is bullied and has to fight back, which inspires his love for boxing. While the tough persona he assumes leads him to join the Annihilators and Loners motorcycle clubs before finally joining the Banditos in 2002, it doesn't take long before the Canadian chapter realizes how talented Musadir is, and he is appointed the Canadian vice president barely four months after joining the club. A joint operation dubbed Project Amigo leads to the arrest of all senior Bandido officials, leaving Musadir as the only successor to Alan Brunette, the Bandido's Canadian national president. Due to his inexperience, Musadir has a rough time leading the club, especially with the club leaders in other countries overlooking him in favor of the more experienced heads in the leadership group. Even most of his efforts to grow the club prove futile, including his 2003 bid to have the Irish Alliance biker gang join the Banditos. Things start to fall apart significantly in December 2005 when Musadir and his followers are expelled from the club by the American Bandito leadership due to their inability to make profits and pay arrears, including their monthly membership fees. According to an officer interviewed by The Globe and Mail's Julian Schur in 2006, because their numbers were so low in Canada, the U.S. Bandidos had tried to separate themselves from Canada. When you get to the point when you're not even breaking even on drugs, like any other trade, you decide to close the business. If you're not bringing anything into the pot, you're a liability instead of an asset. As things escalate quickly, Musadir and his colleagues, dubbing themselves the No Surrender Crew, explore all avenues to get themselves back into the fold. But it only leads to a bloody massacre. On the night of April 7, 2006, a meeting set by the Winnipeg chapter president, Edmonton Sandham, results in the murders of Musadir and his accomplices, in what is referred to as the Shedden Massacre. In the late 90s and early 2000s, George Caracas is a regular truck driver with no criminal record and who even refuses to use drugs. However, his entire life changes when he buys a Harley-Davidson motorcycle and decides to join the Bandidos due to his allegiance to the club. In June 2003, he is surrounded and beaten up by members of the Hells Angels while having lunch in Woodbridge, which they consider their territory. While the event is traumatic, Caracas is rewarded for his troubles with the position of the Bandidos Canadian Secretary under the leadership of the then National President Giovanni Musera with Musher's leadership in turmoil. Caracas faces pressure from his fiancée to quit the club but not before trying his best to get the club reinstated after the expulsion in 2005. Refusing to hand over his bandito patches, he is lured into a trap meeting by the Winnipeg chapter president, Edmonton Sandham, in April 2006, where he and seven other members of the No Surrender crew are murdered in the Shidon Massacre. The Shidon Massacre in 2003 sees the Bandidos' leadership group divided, with other countries' presidents opting to associate with other low-level officials rather than the Canadian president Giovanni Musht. But they are about to receive an unprecedented ed boost. Frank Lente. By this time, Lente is one of the most experienced bikers in the country and decides to join the Banditos after spending seven years out of the bike gang world. Before his seven-year hiatus, Frank had made a name for himself as a member of several clubs, including Satan's Choice Rebels and Diablos, and even forming his own club, the Loner Motorcycle Club. Mater is elated to have Lente by his side, but his joy is short-lived when Lente quits, citing Muser's incompetence, his drug addiction, and the fact that only four of the club's members own working Harley-Davidson motorbikes. After the Shedden Massacre, which results in the killing of the Canadian Bandido top officials, including Mater, Lente attempts to keep the Banditos alive in Canada, but the damage is irreparable. 
In 2007, a statement by Lente on the Bandido's website reads, As of October 2, 2007, the Bandido MC 1% Canada is officially shut down. There isn't no more Bandido MC membership in Canada. He asks that all members with jackets with the Bandido patch email them to an address in Texas. In 2008, Lente is charged with the murder of the Hell's Angel Sergeant at Arms David Buchanan and sentenced to six years in prison. But his story with biker gangs doesn't end there. After being released in 2014, he is almost assassinated in his driveway in 2014, if not for the assassin's gun jamming. However, he remains adamant that he is not worried about his life being in danger. Michael Sandom is regarded as one of the most controversial bandidos leaders in history. For one, he is a serial liar who lies about almost everything, from his deployment to fight the Bosnian War to winning 12 martial arts competitions. Sand's biker gang life starts when he joins a Winnipeg motorcycle club, the Los Moneros, deemed unfit to be Hell's Angels. He gets in touch with the then bandido Canadian president Giovanni Maderi, and he is allowed to join the banditos as the leader of the Winnipeg chapter in 2006. As a standoff ensues between the Toronto chapter and the bandido headquarters, Sandom meets with an American bandido, Peter Price, at the American-Canada border. He is asked to ensure that Mater and his colleagues surrender their patches, having already been expelled in 2005, and in return, he would become president of the banditos in Canada. Sandom hatches a plan which eventually results in the Shidan massacre, and while he has achieved his objective, he gets on the radar of the local authorities. In 2006, he is arrested in connection with the massacre, and during the trial, his true character is revealed. As a Toronto Star correspondent, Peter Edwards mentions, he was more laughable than anything in the trial. More than one person used the nickname George Costanza for him if they made a movie of this. Insignia Bandidos The Bandidos insignia, known as the Fat Mexican, consists of a caricature of a Mexican bandit wearing a sombrero and holding a sword in one hand and a pistol in the other. The design is credited to the club's founder, Donald Chambers. The Fat Mexican bears a resemblance to the Frito Bandito, a cartoon mascot of the Frito's corn chips brand, and according to Bandito's lore, Chambers took the club's name and logo from the mascot. However, the Frito Bandito was not developed until 1967, the year after the Bandito's foundation. In addition to the Fat Mexican and diamond-shaped 1% or emblems, club members also wear other patches on leather or denim vests, known as colors. These patches consist of red lettering displayed on a gold background. The Bandito's color scheme was inspired by that of the United States Marine Corps and chosen by Chambers, a Marine Corps veteran of the Vietnam War. Patches denoting a member's rank and chapter are worn, as are various other patches which have specific meanings. Although the particular meaning of each patch is not publicly known, various law enforcement agencies have identified Bandito's patches which they believe are related to criminal activity. For example, Police have reported that the Expect No Mercy patch is awarded to those who have committed murder on behalf of the club, while the TCB, Taking Care of Business, patch is worn by club officers and nomads. Similar to the Expect No Mercy patch, the CDG, Coup de Grace, patch reportedly signifies a member who has committed a significant act of violence. The Bandidos mottos include, Cut One, We All Bleed, God Forgives, Bandidos Don't, our colors don't run, and we are the people our parents warned us about. Another, more generic, saying of the club is, Bandidos forever, forever Bandidos, BFFB. Membership. Bandidos members must be male and own at least one Harley Davidson motorcycle, although other American-made motorcycles can also be allowed. Prospective members must undertake a three-stage process before being initiated, beginning as a hangaround, before becoming a prospect and then probation. The length of this process is decided by each chapter president and ends when the chapter's members vote unanimously to allow the probationary member to enter the club. A screening process is carried out to prevent infiltration by law enforcement. Upon joining the banditos, each member must sign their motorcycle over to the club. Each club chapter follows a structured hierarchy with a president, vice president, sergeant-at-arms, road captain and secretary-slash-treasurer. 
members must abide by various bylaws, such as not wearing the club patch while riding in a car or truck, and are required to attend meetings, known as church, four times per month. These rules also dictate that any member who fails to attend mandatory group motorcycle rides is fined and must forfeit the title of his motorcycle. Another requirement is that banditos must follow the philosophy, all members are your brothers and your family, and must not fear authority and have a general disdain for the rules of society. Any member who cooperates with law enforcement, for example, is susceptible to disciplinary action. All banditos regalia, including tattoos, is considered club property. Membership fees are required, and are used to cover club expenses, such as funeral costs, and contribute to a legal defense fund. Club bylaws state that any member who commits suicide will not receive a bandito's funeral. The banditos have an estimated membership of between 2,000 and 2,500 worldwide. In the United States, the majority of the club consists of white and Hispanic males. Banditos Organization The Banditos Motorcycle Club is organized by local chapters, with state and regional officers, as well as a national chapter made up of four regional vice presidents and a national president. The leadership of the club consists of an international president, known as El Presidente, who has authority over every club chapter. The club also has nomad chapters, made up of members not bound by geographical location, which are responsible for security, counterintelligence and internal discipline. The Banditos' mother chapter is based in Houston, Texas. The club has 303 chapters worldwide, located in 22 countries in North America, Oceania, Europe and Asia. North America, the United States is home to 93 Banditos chapters, located in 16 states. The club is concentrated in Texas but extends into Louisiana, Missouri, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, New Mexico, Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, Utah, Idaho, Nevada, Washington and Oklahoma. The Banditos expanded into Canada following a merger with the Rock Machine Motorcycle Club in Quebec in 2000. After establishing further chapters in Ontario, Alberta and Manitoba, the club's operations in Canada ceased in November 2007 as a result of infighting, law enforcement efforts, and pulled status from the club's American leadership. In 2004, the Banditos formed a chapter in Costa Rica. Oceania, the first Australian chapter was formed in 1983, in Sydney, by former members of the Comanchero Motorcycle Club. The club has since expanded substantially in Australia and there are 45 Banditos chapters throughout the country. The Banditos have a small but growing presence in New Zealand after a rocky start in 2012. They claim to have more than a dozen patched members and prospects in the Christchurch area. There are approximately 90 Banditos chapters in Europe. The first European chapter opened in Marseille in France in 1989. This was followed by expansion into the Nordic countries, with branches being established in Denmark in 1993, Sweden in 1994, and Finland and Norway in 1995. The German department of the Banditos was chartered in 2000. Chapters were then founded in Italy in 2001 and on the Channel Islands in 2003. The Banditos formed its first chapter in the Netherlands in 2014. The club was prohibited in the country in 2017, However in recent years the club has also expanded heavily into Spain, Belgium, Estonia, Greece, England and Ireland. Additionally, it is reportedly considering establishing a presence in Russia and Eastern Europe. In 2001, the Banditos were established in Thailand via a merger with the Diablos Motorcycle Club in Pattaya. The club further expanded to Malaysia and Singapore in 2006. The first chapter opened in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates in 2016 and it is considered the first international motorcycle club to open in the Middle East. Banditos History The Banditos Motorcycle Club was founded by 36-year-old dock worker Donald Eugene Chambers on March 4, 1966, in San Leon, Texas. Chambers named the club in honor of the Mexican bandits who lived by their own rules, and he recruited members from biker bars locally in Houston as well as in Corpus Christi, Galveston, and San Antonio. Like other outlaw motorcycle clubs, 
They call themselves One Percenters, a phrase coined by the former president of the American Motorcyclist Association who once stated that 99% of motorcyclists were law-abiding citizens and 1% outlaws. By the early 1970s, the club had over 100 members, including many Vietnam War veterans. Ronald Jerome Hodge took over from Chambers as the Bandidos president in 1972. Hodge was nicknamed Mr. Prospect because of the short amount of time in which he was awarded his club membership, and he later became known as Stepmother in deference to Chambers' moniker Mother. Under Hodge's leadership, the Bandidos became an international motorcycle club when the first foreign chapter was established in Sydney, Australia in 1983. The Australian branch was founded by Anthony Mark Spencer, who had previously encountered Bandidos members during a visit to the United States. Hodge was sentenced to five years in prison in December 1988 for conspiring to bomb homes and automobiles belonging to members of a rival club, and he died of heart disease in 1992. In 1989, the club was established in Europe when a chapter was formed in Marseille, France. Subsequent expansion into the Nordic countries in the 1990s led to a violent feud with the Hells Angels. The third Bandidos international president, James Edward Lang, as well as his successor, Charles Craig Johnston, were each sentenced to 10 years imprisonment on drug charges in November 1998. George Wiegers, who served as international president between 1998 and 2005, was convicted of racketeering charges in October 2006. The Bandidos embarked on a failed endeavor to establish themselves in Canada after merging with the Montreal-based Rock Machine Motorcycle Club in 2000. The Bandidos ceded Quebec to the Hells Angels at the conclusion of the province's deadliest biker war in 2003. In 2007, the Bandidos Canadian chapters went defunct following the internal Shedden Massacre.